First of all, I just wanted to say that you, you, you know, I agreed with many things that you said, but you seem to think that having lunch with a banker wasn't a fantastically cultural opportunity. You have not had lunch with bankers from TD, right? <laughs> I'm sure that many of you will be. It is a fantastically cultural, wonderful experience. In fact, I had lunch with Jane just last week. So I wanted to say that. Secondly, please don't cancel your subscriptions to The Economist because, of course, as you know, the editor of The Economist, John Micklethwaite, is our next speaker. And if you do that, I'm going to tell him that you told everybody to cancel their subscriptions to his magazine. Yeah, so well, after the review they gave my last book, it's the least I can do. <laughs> I think they also ranked Vancouver badly in terms of our infrastructure because there was a slow highway in Victoria. So we're, we're, we're going to bring that up uh, with him. So I'll just ask the first question while we get some other ones collected. So I was quite intri intrigued with your comment about political will and how we really need political will to make sure that we uh, stop deleting our killer apps. From a historical perspective and going back as far as you like, what lessons can we learn about creating political will to make the right policy decisions? It's a hard thing to generalize about, needless to say. Whenever I look at the way in which the United States makes decisions about fiscal policy, I'm reminded of Winston Churchill's great quip, which I think I quote in the book, that the United States always does the right thing when all the alternatives have been exhausted. <laughs> And we are in a process of exhausting alternatives uh, right now. The United States, some of us were discussing this earlier today informally, is in a completely unsustainable fiscal path. Uh, there's no question at all in my mind that fiscal policy on its present trajectory will bring the United States to a major crisis uh, within certainly 10 years. And that's easy to show because you just need to calculate the share of federal tax revenues being absorbed uh, by interest payments on the federal debt. I'm now going to use the words in the English language that I hate the most. Some of you may wish to cover your ears. If Paul Krugman is right, <laughs> which is not wholly inconceivable, and interest rates in the United States don't move up suddenly out of uh, mar market fear at this fiscal trajectory, even if he's right, the consistent growth of the debt will consistently grow the share of tax revenues absorbed by interest payments. Currently, it's 10%. If you look at the Congressional Budget Office projections, by 2050, it will be 100%. Now, that's an impossibility. And that shows you that something's got to give. But what is completely missing at the moment is any clear path that will take us from this unsustainable trajectory to one in which even within 10 years there's anything resembling fiscal equilibrium. In practice, we have a game of brinkmanship between the two parties. And that game of brinkmanship is a, a very dangerous game. The debt ceiling game will be played again this year. We're heading towards a train wreck if the so-called sequestration process uh, goes into effect next year. That, that's drastic cuts across the board uh, affecting every uh, government agency. And I, I have to say, I struggle to see how out of this political system the kind of leadership that you were talking about, Leah, can come. I wish I could say that I see it in the field of candidates for the Republican nomination. <laughs> One thing that uh, Don didn't mention when he was quoting headlines uh, from my Newsweek column is that the one thing you don't write as a journalist is the headline. And sometimes I look at those headlines and go, what? Uh -huh. And that was true of the Neil Ferguson endorses Mitt Romney. Uh, headline, which I don't think I did, but at any event, it's hard to believe when one looks uh, at the way that campaign is going that we're dealing here with leadership in the Churchillian 
in the Churchillian mode. And that's what the United States needs, what it needs. It, it needs somebody with that capacity of courage that we last saw in Britain in Margaret Thatcher. Uh, whether it can magically materialize before the crisis, I frankly doubt. My fear is that as with national security issues, the United States will not take that necessary measure, that necessary step, until after the crisis has struck. And believe me, none of us will be unscathed if that's the case. We've got a microphone right here. Frank? Just wondering what your view is, or your greatest criticism of Jared Diamond's book, uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel, which took the view that evolution of the world happened by accidental reasons, and yours, which was by design. Let me make it, it clear. I have the greatest respect for Jared Diamond as a, as a scholar, and, and Guns, Germs, and Teal is a fantastic book that everybody should read. It explains a lot. It explains why Eurasia uh, became richer in the ancient and, and indeed into the medieval periods than the rest of the world, Australasia, uh, New Guinea. What it doesn't do is to explain why one end of Eurasia then got so much richer than the other end after about 1500. Because of the kind of model that he uses as an anthropologist stroke uh, geographer, he, he explains what seems to me important, but not the most important thing. And I think even he would acknowledge that in a in an essay which I cite in the book that he subsequently published, he argued that the key to Western predominance over, over Asia was competition. And that first killer app uh, that makes my first chapter was inspired by that essay of, of Diamonds, which I, I acknowledge in the book. So I think Guns, Germs and Steel answers a question about ancient history and, and even about prehistory. But what it can't do is explain modern history, everything after 1500. Uh, he only really did that in, in that later essay. And even that, of course, isn't a sufficient explanation. Competition alone can't really explain this, because competition between multiple states isn't always good. If it was always good, then the Balkans would be a really rich part of the world. <laughs> and that's why, once I had made that mental leap, and I would thought, well, that's really persuasive, but it's not completely persuasive. That was really what started me off on the, on the argument of this book. So in some ways, the book is a, is, is a conversation. It's part of a, a, a conversation between, between me and Diamond, and more generally, between those of us who believe that institutions matter, and those of us, uh, or those of them, who think that it's resource endowments, it's geography, or the weather, or the incidence of disease. By the way, if, if there are any New York Times readers here, you may have noticed Tom Friedman giving a big shout out uh, to uh, another book that, that takes the institutional line just published by my good friend Jim Robinson and Darren Asamoglu, uh, which I think is why nations fail. Uh, there's therefore quite a body of academic work now focusing on these institutional, these institutional explanations. I'm not in any sense claiming to have originated this. We have another live question from here. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, Professor Ferguson, uh, with uh, the name Michael Walker, you can uh, depend that I'm delighted that finally the Scots are getting the, uh, the uh, credit that they deserve for having invented uh, the modern world. Um, <laughs> uh, and um, I found your book uh, very interesting. And I think everybody here are fans, and so the, the, the comments that I have are, are not in any meant, way meant to be uh, critical, uh, but, but hopefully to be additive. Um, one of the things that, I, as I read your book, and, and it was a very clever device to use uh, the downloads of apps as a, as a way of, of, of characterizing how these institutional uh, options get adopted, I felt that that rather you, that a more apt application would have been as a virus. Mm. 
because these things are not downloaded in the sense that somebody sits and says, I'm going to take this and I'm going to take that and I'm not going to take this and I'm not going to take that. In fact, the process is really viral. And we saw that, we had, a, we had an ex a historical experiment in which some of us were involved and that was the, the conversion of Hong Kong. And as you might remember, when, when Hong Kong was to revert to China, everybody was very worried. And most Chinese and many of my friends vacated Hong Kong and came to Vancouver. That was the first big rush of people to Vancouver because they didn't trust what would then ensue because they thought that Hong Kong was about to be invaded by China. But of course we now know that just exactly the opposite happened. That China was invaded not just by institutions but invaded by a virus that uh, has, has replicated and is now impossible in any way to suppress. So the app uh, analogy fails because it's too mechanistic and it is not uh, instructive enough about the, about the way in which this inveigles into every aspect and every pore and every avenue of the society. Um, no, I had another thought. Uh, <laughs> or a question, maybe. Uh, that, <laughs> yes, question. yes, let's do the a question. question. Let's do a question. The question, the question is this. Oh, you could just say whether, question. You could just say question mark. <laughs> yes, you know, and I, might, I, might, I must confess that, that, that I, spent, I spent 30 years with Milton and Rose Friedman developing the Economic Freedom of the World Index, which has been used by the recent book that you mentioned yeah. almost entirely to describe the institutions that fail and succeed. So that's, I'm, the, the question I'm now about to pose to you is not, uh, is not without some, uh, some previous thought. And that is, do you think that in the end it is really the aspiration that people have that is most important. The aspiration that, that, you know, whether they have science or they don't have science, the aspiration that people have to copy what they see as a successful model. And I had my first demonstration of this 40 years ago when I went to China and watched students collect around a photographer whose simple and, and only prop was a, pair, a, a jean jacket that these Chinese kids wanted to have on and have a picture taken in a jean jacket because they aspired to what the jean jacket meant. So I think that I would ask you to, to reflect and give us your thoughts about how important are the aspirations of the people of China and the people of the United States and the people of everywhere in the world uh, more so than anything else in determining where we will go in the next 25 or 30 or 40 or 50 years. Well, thank you very much for, for those, um, those reflections and questions. Let me begin with the idea that, that viruses are a better analogy. I, I know exactly what you mean by this. Let me allude to the work of another justly influential scholar, Richard Dawkins. In The Selfish Gene, Dawkins threw out, which is another book everyone should read, threw out the idea that there might be in the realm of ideas, uh, memes, uh, which would have the same by analogy characteristic as genes in that they would, uh, they would replicate and have an, a, a design to replicate themselves, but could also mutate uh, in the process of replication. I think that's a, a very good analogy if what you're trying to explain is the spread of an idea. Ideas do spread virally. We, we can even measure this. I'm doing some work at the moment on the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment's a remarkable phenomenon because in a relatively short space of time, the entire vocabulary of intellectual discourse changed. And we can track this by looking at the frequency with which some words were used. If you track liberty, for example, or uh, rights of man as a phrase, using Google's very powerful uh, technology, uh, you can see how the word liberty went viral in the mid-18th uh, century. You can also do the same for words like terror, which you won't be surprised to hear went viral after about 1792. The, um, the story, therefore, is that words or concepts or ideas can indeed spread in, in a viral way. They can be transmitted from 
person to person, some more contagious than others. But I don't think that that's the right analogy if, if one's talking about institutions. The notion of a legal order based on private property rights, upheld by a constitutional framework within which there is a representative institution, is not the kind of thing that spreads virally. It's too complicated for that. It needs conscious replication. Uh, my colleague at Harvard, David Armitage, has a nice book on how the uh, terminology of the Declaration of Independence spread because it was literally copied by those seeking national independence in what we used to call the third world, the most famous example being Ho Chi Minh. I think institutions, constitutions, complex organizational documents that are supposed to bind people over generations, don't spread in the same way as, as simple concepts. They need to be downloaded and installed. It is a difficult process to introduce a constitution to a country that is modelled on the constitution of another country. And by the way, it doesn't always work. So I think there's a need for us to use both these different analogies to understand how the historical process works. In some ways, we're talking about network effects. Those of you who, who are interested in technology will, will know exactly what, what I mean. I'm not just talking here about Facebook. I'm talking about the kind of networks that exist to transmit ideas or to transmit institutions. But I think there's a key difference here, which has to do with the complexity of the thing itself. A way of organizing society that is consistent over generations is more than just a word. It's more complex even than a YouTube video. It's a how to do it manual. That's what the constitutions and laws of a society are. What we see in the history of, say, the British Empire is, among other things, the systematic spread of a legal system to very far-flung places. The legacy of that spread of the common law continues to be felt today, continues, according to some research, to distinguish some economies from those that didn't have that legal system. I don't think that's viral. That was conscious downloading of an institutional framework by imperial administrators who knew exactly what they were doing. So, uh, oh, there was another question. No, no. Oh, okay, we've got another question back there. Does aspiration matter? Sure. <laughs> well, there's some more short questions now to Peter. Um. I enjoyed your book greatly, and I was left with one question uh, at the end of it, which is, um, especially as a Vancouverite, and that is, so why does it matter? Who, who cares if, um, if, um, if, if the way I see it, the, the East has joined the West? They've really downloaded our killer apps and have joined us. Um, and, um, and if the Koreans are building more ships than the Scottish and are working harder than the Scottish and are more Presbyterian than the Scottish, is, is that a bad thing or is that a good thing? And when I think of that, I, I, the, the vivid picture I have in my mind is of a boss I had from New York who came here um, to Vancouver in 1990 and quickly summed up the history of BC as, as well, you had the Aborigines, they lived along the, the, the peoples, lived, the First Nations lived along the shores, they had a great life, they, the fish came up once a year, they scooped them out of the river, there was berries, you know, a, a few yards away, deer were running around. And then all these Europeans came in and started rushing around and building things and they're saying, what are all these people rushing around for? They're crazy. And now, and this is 20 years ago, he said, now the Europeans, they're sitting on uh, wreck beach naked, smoking pot and watching all these Asians coming in here and going, why are all these people rushing around for? Why can't they just <laughs> chill out a little bit? And so, my, my question is, isn't it just a good thing that they're kicking our butts and uh, making us work a little harder? And isn't this just part of the competition that, that started in Europe and is now uh, worldwide? So I'm trying to hard, uh, understand why is it a bad thing uh, and is it a bad thing? Well, I think this is a great question. You know, should we care? Uh, does it matter? At some level, it's, it's, as I said, a cause for celebration that the most populous societies in the world have abandoned 
non-functioning models and are embracing institutions that, that, that make for prosperity. But I was very careful to make the point that, that China has not downloaded all six of the killer apps. It, it remains a one-party state in which the rule of law is highly compromised by the arbitrary power of the party at the central and, above all, at the local level. And I think that if anybody thinks seriously about history, they should feel at least some disquiet at the prospect of within four years, according to the IMF, an economy that is run by the Communist Party becoming the largest in the world. We should feel some disquiet at the thought that a fifth of humanity currently live in a communist-run state which retains a power over its people that we all would find intolerable were we subject to it. Simply to say, what goes around comes around, and it's probably good, is, I think, dangerously complacent. Of course, it may be that China will continue to move in the direction that I hope it will, in the direction of the rule of law, in the direction of representative government, and away from the one-party state with all the abuses that come with that. But it is far from certain. Right now, the reality is that, unlike in the Cold War, the ideological antagonist is going to win the economic race. The Soviet Union failed to do that. At no point did it come close to overtaking the United States, despite all the bluster of Khrushchev. The IMF has China overtaking the US in terms of GDP in 2016. And in some ways, that understates the scale of the Chinese challenge. The Chinese challenge in the realm of cyberspace is very real. And if your corporation hasn't experienced it, then you are either lucky or oblivious. That's a challenge, a strategic challenge in what might be called the new frontier of strategy that I take very seriously indeed. And so, by the way, do the leading uh, military thinkers and uh, strategists of the United States. So, no, I don't think we can simply say, ah, whatever, uh, it's fine. It's not fine. It's not fine that leadership is passing to a society that is not based on individual freedom. That is not fine. And anybody who thinks it's all going to be okay doesn't really understand the historical process. Transitions in the balance of power are seldom peaceful. And that's another important point I try to make in the book. We need to be very acutely aware of the dangers that lie ahead as this moment arrives when the US, for the first time since the 1880s, ceases to be the dominant economy in the world. I hope I've answered your question, sir. We just have a follow-up question here, and then we'll go back to the audience. So you speak about the success of the 300 million Chinese middle class. How do you think the Chinese government will extend this opportunity to the other 1 billion of their citizens? Well, it's not yet 300 million. I mean, it's, it's probably not even 100 million. But by 2020, most people rec reckon that there'll be a, a middle class of some 200 million. Um, but that will still leave an enormous number of Chinese people living in what we would, we would consider abject poverty. As is well known, capitalism, when it's unleashed, generates inequality. You don't have to be a Marxist to believe that. China's Gini coefficient, it's, as a measure of inequality, that's quite a good one. It's probably getting close to the US now. Uh, it's not as, as bad as, say, Brazil, but it's certainly a much more unequal society than it was in the time of of Mao. Do the Chinese have a plan for their poor? Well, they have a better plan for their poor than, say, the Indians. What's really striking if you look at uh, China's development, developmental trajectory is that many, many more people are being lifted out of uh, that super poor sub-Saharan African poverty in China than in any other uh, comparable country. The middle class is going to be way larger than the Indian middle class. Uh, if you simply took look at people with uh, incomes above 10,000 up to 100,000, it's a much, much larger number. So I think that the Chinese could credibly claim that they are 
they are moving in the right direction. Uh, but what they have to do is to continue to take people out of basic agriculture and move them into cities. That's the plan, and that's what they're doing. And that the speed of urbanization compares with the speed of urbanization in the United States uh, 50 to 100 years ago. So I don't think that's their problem. I mean, it's not the super poor that, that the, really the Chinese regime worries about. I recently asked a leading economist there, what was his biggest worry? And I thought we would have a conversation about the real estate bubble uh, or possibly excess investment in infrastructure. But actually, the conversation we had was entirely about politics. And he said, I, I worry about how we give some kind of voice to this new articulate class that microblogs about corruption every time a train crashes. And that, that I think, is, is the real challenge that they face. And, and it's by no means clear. There is no clear roadmap that tells you how you get from a one-party state to something that resembles a uh, representative government. We have a couple more questions on China and Europe. Um, first of all, I thought I was coming to see Craig Ferguson tonight. You turned out better. <laughs> Who's Craig Ferguson? <laughs> uh, so how will Hong Kong do in the next few years? Uh, better than under the UK rule to 1997. There have been a lot of corruption charges recently. Will that damage Hong Kong? Hong Kong did tremendously well under British rule. I mean, it's, it's one of the things that's sometimes forgotten that, in fact, if you just look at per capita GDP, it, it, it did as well as Singapore in the same time frame with a very, very different economic model and Hong Kong is one of the countries that comes out, or rather one of the cities, I should say, that comes out really well from these institutional assessments that I've been talking about. If you, if you go back to that World Economic Forum database, Hong Kong does really, really well on almost every measure of regulation, rule of law, taxation, ease of doing business, many of the things that uh, Mr. Fraser was talking about earlier. Hong Kong is doing well and has been doing in some ways better. But, of course, there's this concern that the traffic is two-way. It's not just that Hong Kong is Hong Kongizing China. I think China is pretty much Chinifying Hong Kong, particularly in terms of politics. And the corruption is becoming an issue there, as, as was predictable. What's, I think, often forgotten about the way China works is that it has that susceptibility to corruption that most one-party states have, but we don't read about it to the same extent that we read about corruption in, say, India. We, read, we can read about corruption in India because they have a free press. Mm -hmm. And the free press thrives on corruption stories. Mm -hmm. We really do not see the full extent of corruption uh, in China because we read selectively about low-level corruption when the party decides to encourage uh, its officials by make an ex making an example of a few small fry. So I'm not sure. Hong Kong's future, it seems to me, still hangs in the balance. It ultimately depends on what happens in Beijing. If they can make the transition, as somebody was putting it to me, a Chinese uh, academic uh, with whom I recently discussed this in Singapore, if China can make the transition to the rule of law, not to multi-party democracy, but to the rule of law, then that will be a very healthy step in the right direction. And I think that's the model that many intellectuals and reformers in, in Beijing are, are aiming for. They, they know they can't leap to multi-party democracy. Most people, I think, agree on that. But they do see a way of moving towards greater security of private property and more constraint on the party at the central and local level through law. Now, I think that's the thing we need to track. That's the thing we need to follow most closely. Is the work ethic app not just another way of saying that culture is a factor in the rise of the West? And uh, on that note, there's a secondary question. Um, could you talk a bit about which cultures you see uh, succeeding going forward in terms of work ethic? Let me, let me put it this way, Leah. I'm not, a, I'm not a cultural determinist. I'm an institutional determinist. You, you can get the work ethic regardless of your cultural background, whether you are Jewish, Protestant, a follower of Shinto, you name it, if the institutional setup where you live gives you the right incentives. And it was a great mistake in the work of Max Weber 
to prioritize culture in the way that he did in the famous essay that I spent a long time discussing, the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. That confused, I think, more than one generation about the nature of the relationship between culture and prosperity. And it encourages all kinds of, I think, unhelpful attitudes if you say, well, one culture is better than other cultures. Uh, it's not a great deal better than saying that one race is better than other races. And I think the empirical evidence is really clear. It's not about culture. It's about institutions. And the reason we can see that is that the work ethic has relocated in ways that Weber would never have predicted. Weber took the view, along with many people in the late 19th and early 20th century, that China was a kind of static society, sclerotic, fundamentally different from the West because Confucianism made the Chinese conservative and hostile to innovation. But that's actually wrong. In truth, people from a Chinese cultural background now work harder by far than people from a German Protestant background like Weber. Uh, my my favourite joke is the joke about Germans and South Koreans. Uh, which, which I told earlier today, and that's not going to stop me from telling it again. <laughs> it's not a joke, it's actually a fact. The average South Korean works a thousand hours more per year than the average German. A thousand. And that is why, when you go on vacation, the Germans are already there. <laughs> And when you go, it's like, Auf Wiedersehen, wir haben noch zwei Wochen, ciao. Well, I think that um, uh, the person who submitted the next question, Bill McClagan, really wants those people that are going to work and bill an extra thousand hours per year. Is that right, Bill? Uh, <laughs> it seems to me, uh, for those of you who don't know, he's with Blake's a law firm, just in case my jokes aren't as good as, not, as Neil's. Uh, it seems to me that these apps evolve. What is the seventh app, or, or is there not one? Alcohol. <laughs> I, uh, there's a suppressed seventh chapter of this book. I, it, I suppressed it myself when I realized what an incredibly dangerous thing it would be for my teenage son to read. <laughs> but in this seventh chapter, I argue that the other killer app, of Western civilization was that of all civilizations, it learnt how best to handle alcohol. Perhaps I shouldn't say handle, to consume alcohol. And when you think about it, this is not an entirely frivolous point. Is there any greater product of Western civilization than a bottle of 1945 Chateau Lafitte? <laughs> I certainly can't think of many. Other civilizations struggled with alcohol, prohibited it out of, say, the Prophet Muhammad's fear of what alcohol could do. And yet we not only tamed alcohol, but we produced an amazing myriad varieties of delicious, <laughs> intoxicating beverage, of which, of course, the greatest is Scotch whiskey. <laughs> and if you want to know how that app was downloaded, I can take you to some bars in Japan that will make your eyes pop out your head. So, I mean, I don't mean this entirely frivolously. I, I've thought a lot about, about whether I should have written that chapter. It would have been another opportunity to quote Churchill. <laughs> who, of course, consumed more alcohol in his lifetime than all of us put together and still, and still won the Second World War <laughs> against a teetotaler. <laughs> He's got a point. Can I have another glass of wine? Yeah, Neil, I'm not sure if you know this audience well enough if you think that he drank more than the rest of us combined. <laughs> but, um, I think we have another question, actually, just over there at the mic. Thanks, Leah. First, I'd like, I'd like to thank you, Leah, for straightening out. I was, of course, uh, Neil, when you mentioned that uh, having lunch with a banker was um, 
a boring thing to do. I had feared that you all had lunch today with the bankers from TV. <laughs> so, oh. yeah, I really appreciate I it. I want to clarify something. That sounded really good in my head. I was referring to lunch with Swiss bankers. Okay, oh. now we haven't sorted it out. Uh, question, you, you characterize in, in your book, and again today, the, uh, the 500 years as the great divergence. Um, you, you mentioned it was about a 20, maybe it's a 20 bagger as far as a relative uh, standard of living, which in compound terms is actually very slow. I mean, it's going to be fits and starts, but it's a very gentle separation that could be missed. Uh, and you cap it off at 1978. A lot of people are talking about the great divergence of the last 30 years within Western culture, between I guess symbolized most recently as by the uh, Occupy Wall Street. Mm. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the divergence within Western culture. Uh, if there were some apps, maybe the people down, you know, deloading certain yeah. apps within the culture. If there's anything that you can talk about and what you think it means for Western culture going forward that we've created a, a, a different balance between uh, the haves and the have-nots, if you will. Occupy Harvard was one of the stranger phenomena of last year. I mean, I could understand Occupy Wall Street. I could kind of handle that. But I still don't understand what those people were doing pitching their tents in Harvard Yard. I mean, I said, have you any idea? This is the most liberal institution in the world apart from maybe Berkeley. Why are you occupying Harvard? It can't be Larry Summers. <laughs> The Occupy movement was, as that illustrates, tremendously incoherent, almost completely incapable of articulating its, its program. And that, of course, is why it's achieved nothing. But it wasn't entirely wrong, because there's no question that a remarkable widening of the income gap, of income distribution, occurred from the late 1970s until now. And this is there if you look at almost any serious measure. Median household incomes in the United States stagnated and even fell. In real terms, the 1% did staggeringly better than everybody else. The 0.01% did staggeringly better than everybody else in the 1%. It's a remarkable phenomenon. But what are we to make of it? What explains it? What caused it? About this, there is much, much less clarity, and that, I think, was the problem that Occupy Wall Street had. It was not, to my mind, credible to blame this widening of the income gap on Goldman Sachs or any other institution headquartered uh, in and around Wall Street. It wasn't remotely credible when Jeff Sachs stood up in Zuccotti Park and gave his deranged speech denouncing the 1% for their criminal doings, because that really doesn't explain the widening of the income distribution. Even though there clearly were some criminal doings, that's not the reason that income distribution has become less equal. Part of the reason is globalization, something Sachs himself knows full well. But globalization increases inequality not only because it increases the returns on certain kinds of capital, particularly on certain kinds of education. But crucially, it reduces the returns on unskilled labor in the West. I think a far better guide to this problem than Sachs is my friend Charles Murray, whose book Coming Apart focuses not on the antics of the 1%, but mainly on the disintegration of the bottom 20%. And this disintegration of the American working class is a really, really powerful and alarming story. The breakdown of social cohesion, the breakdown of the family, the breakdown of occupation, the decline of educational standards. These things together have taken what was once the bedrock of US society and wrecked it. And the cognitive elite, as Murray calls them, the people who go to Harvard and live in zip codes like the one I live in, 02138, we don't see those people. We do not see them. So there is a very real disintegration that's happened. But its causes, I don't think, are well understood. 
And it's quite wrong, and indeed, I think, disingenuous, to blame, to blame it on Wall Street, or for that matter, on Harvard. It's really what's gone wrong at the bottom end of the social scale that is the key. Now, Charles Murray argues in the book, though it's, it's not made entirely explicit, that he thinks the key is the way in which social programs enacted in the 60s and subsequently eroded the cohesion of working class life, particularly the family, and reduced incentives to work, reduced incentives to study, increased incentives uh, to screw around and bum around. That's the alternative hypothesis. If you believe Jeff Sachs, what we need is for the federal government to play an even bigger role and increase its, its influence on the social life. If you believe Charles Murray, you think the federal government's actually been the cause of much of this social disintegration. I'm with Murray in this argument, uh, but it's a very difficult argument to make. It's a very, very hard thing to show that the disintegration at the lower end of the social scale is mainly a result of government programs. Right now, for me, that's a hypothesis, not one that's completely founded. I have just two more questions here, and I think we've got one from the audience with Mitt. Short, sorry, do we have Hamish? Okay. I'm, I'm interested in the idea of a seventh app, and I, I agree with you entirely on institutions. And one of the, I think, the more interesting books of the last 20 years is Victor Davis Hansen's uh, Carnage and Culture, which is really about the institutions that allowed the West to have military supremacy. And of course, as an economic historian, I suppose you believe that there's a certain economic inevitability to the rise of the West. But I'd like you to comment on Hansen's ideas that the Western way of war, which comes from, in some ways, things like property rights and dissent and democracy, which influence the way Western armies have typically fought, how that has had an impact or an explanatory power in the rise of the last 500 years. Well, thank you. I'll never show any disrespect for a fellow fellow of the Hoover Institution. So all praises to, to Victor for, for his work. Um, I'm not the kind of historian who thinks that everything's economically determined, uh, least of all outcomes in war, which often go against the economic grain. After all, if economics determined wars, the US wouldn't have had much trouble defeating North Vietnam, would it? The key, I think, to understanding why the Western way of war became so successful does not lie quite where he locates it. I tell the story, and if you've read the book, you'll know this, but, but I think it's a great story, of Benjamin Robbins. Benjamin Robbins was a self-taught mathematician and physicist who, who dreamt of emulating Isaac Newton. And he did. He ended up being elected to the Royal Society. He wasn't in any way of a man of means. He, in fact, made his living as a, an engineer, civil engineer, for the British East India Company. And it was while he was doing that work that he applied Newtonian physics to ballistics. And Robbins's book, New Principles of Gunnery, was a revolution in military affairs almost without parallel. There's a, guy, there's a guy at this table who's going like this. <laughs> clutching his brow, thinking, can I look at my Blackberry? Will he notice? <laughs> I just want to make this fun. So, before we all clutch our brows and reach for our soon-to-be obsolete Canadian blackberries. <laughs> Sorry, couldn't resist it. <laughs> Let me tell you about Benjamin Robbins' great discovery. His, his great discovery, sir, was that if you apply Newtonian principles to the trajectory of a projectile fired from a rifled barrel, adjust for wind resistance, it hits the target quite often. From the moment that Robbins' New Principles of Gunnery was published, it immediately was translated into all other European languages, European artillery became accurate. Nobody else had that. Even on the eve of the First World War, the Turks were still trying to defend the Straits of the Black Sea with essentially medieval cannons. <laughs> 
That, more than anything else, explains why from the mid-18th century until the 20th century, Western armies usually won. Because most war is about artillery. From about that point, that's what it's about. The First World War is not decided by bayonets. It's a war of artillery between two very heavily armed modern Western forces. So my take on this is that military power primarily is a function of scientific and technological innovation. And everything else, courage, discipline, all of that is for the birds. If you've got the accurate artillery, then you'll likely win. And if, if you track US military history, it's essentially the history of ever more accurate projectiles. We've now reached the point where the precision is so astonishing that we can use missile technology remotely to kill specific individuals from an amazingly long range. All we need to know is the address. <laughs> that's the kind of military power that really counts. And that's why the Chinese ability to close the gap in the area of cyberspace is the thing that should most worry the Pentagon. Especially since, incredibly, some of the hardware ended up being outsourced to China to be built. If you think that stuff came back clean, you don't know China. <laughs> I'm going to um, just uh, wrap things up. I think, Mitch, you had one last question while I get uh, a few things organized here. I'm going to ask the question, not make a speech. Um, in your you, six apps, you mentioned the rule of law. But one of the ones you don't mention, I just wonder about, is a free and open society, and whether or not the Western free and open societies have led to dominance and the fact that China has not yet developed a free and open society. I spent a lot of time talking about that question of how freedom exactly fits into the argument as I was, I suppose, revising the final draft of the book. And I, I realized that what I was really arguing was that the institutions that I'm describing were institutions that upheld, in various ways, freedom. It's often a mistake to declare human rights. It's often an illusion of our, of our Western civilization that if you just list the rights that people have, magically they'll have them. What really creates freedom are secure institutional frameworks within which it can flourish. The economic freedom that is central to competition, the intellectual freedom that is central to successful scientific inquiry, and so forth. The freedom to dispose of our property that was so central to, to Locke's thinking. So I think really what, what civilization is about as a book is the mainsprings, the frameworks within which freedom can flourish. I don't have any desire to backdate human rights, democracy, feminism, gay rights, or any of the recent freedoms that we've discovered. They're all of very recent provenance, some as recent as the 1960s. And they can't therefore have any explanatory value if we're trying to explain the rise of the West. Even, dare I say it, freedom of speech was highly circumscribed in most Western societies until very recently. Just ask Oscar Wilde. Think of all the things that were still restricted, uh, banned from publication in England. Think of, of Lawrence's uh, Lady Chatterley's Lover. No, the freedom of expression, like so many of the freedoms we enjoy today, is the kind of luxury you can afford once you've got the real killer apps to work, once you've established the real foundations of, of freedom. And in that sense, this is a not entirely comfortable history. It's not entirely what liberals want to hear about the past. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I'm rather, I'm rather fond of the book. I hope it's, <laughs> I hope it's in some measure upsetting uh, to, to readers of a more liberal persuasion and encouraging to those of a more conservative persuasion. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very thank much. You.